Hey Ballerinos, welcome back to Reformation Rambles, a series where I tell you all about the history of the European Reformation. Today we'll be discussing the Swedish reformer who laid the foundations of the Nordic legal system. Born the 6th of January 1493 in Arebo in south central Sweden, to Peter Olafsson and Christina Lorstotter. Let's talk about Olaf Petri. Part 1. Early Life and Education Olaf Petri was born Olaf Pearson or Peterson, depending on what you read. I'm not really clear on if it was both or if we just anglicised it, because we love to do that. But in most books he is referred by his Latin name of Olaf Petri, so that's what we're going to use for most of this video. Even though he wasn't born with that name. Okay, good. Go. His father was just a local blacksmith, so he learned to read and write at the local Carmel Monastery before studying at the University of Uppsala. He studied theology and German in the early 16th century. I mean, what could go wrong there? He then attended the University of Leipzig in 1516 before going on to attend the University of Wittenberg, where he would meet uh, Reformation legends. <laughs> It's largely believed he was influenced by these, you know, Reformation dream boys such as Martin Luther and Philip Melanchthon, and he would return to Sweden in 1519. In fact, he nearly died on the return journey. His ship ran aground on Gotland Island in the middle of a storm, and he survived. He then lived in Gotland for a while, um, preaching, assisting the local priests. And that brings us to part two, climbing and reforming the church. In 1520, Olaf moved to Strangness. I will put the names of places up on the screen. I know my pronunciation is piss poor. On the mainland where he accepted ordination as a deacon and became the secretary of the serving bishop, who was Matthias Gregerson. Lielhey. He'd go on to become Chancellor of the Diocese of Strangness, Canon of Strangness Cathedral, and the Dean of the Cathedral School. He's a busy bee. <laughs> then he dropped and then he dropped all that and followed Bishop Gregerson, who by this point is kind of his mentor, to Stockholm to attend the crowning of King Christian the Second. We've talked about before. He took on the throne, maintained it for about a year or so before his brother Frederick took over. Yada yada, it's all in that video if you want a detailed summary. His coronation became nicknamed the Stockholm Bloodbath. This was where Christian invited loads of people to his coronation celebrations, including a group of people who had strongly opposed him called the Stir Party. A few days in, he locked the castle doors, had all of his enemies arrested. Wild times, right? 80 to 90 people were killed, and these people included Olaus's mentor, Bishop Gregerson. Yeah. Olaus publicly expressed his anger at this, and was nearly executed. This guy's life is just narrowly avoiding death time and time again. A German guy who had seen him when he was studying in Wittenberg identified him as a German citizen, even though he was actually Swedish. Based on this, he was not executed. This guy saved his life by misidentifying him. So he survives. King Christian tries to appoint his pal, Jens Alderson Beldenek, to the now vacant Strangness bishopric. Since Gregerson bit the dust. But soon, most Danish people, which were most of Christian's supporters, went home to Denmark. And Jens wanted to as well. So a guy called Laurentius Andre starts trying to take throne, take throne, the bishopric. I, I go into a bit more detail about all the stuff that happened next up here, but long story short, a new king of Sweden was eventually crowned, Gustav Vasa. He was actually Swedish. This was celebrated as the end of Danish control in Sweden. Now, a few years before he became king in 1521, Olaus Petri's dad died, and he and his brother joined Vasa's insurgents. They would go on to attend Vasa's coronation and very quickly swore fealty to the new monarch. Soon after, Olaf became the kingdom's chancellor, which is a fucking big promotion. Four years later, 
Olaus is appointed Stockholm town secretary, so he moves there. Where he'd also become a town councillor and a judge. No legal training whatsoever, we'll talk about his legal career in a moment. This is the time period where Olaus becomes known for his advocacy of Lutheranism. In October of 1524 at Uppsala Cathedral, Olaus and his brother were excommunicated for heresy, which a few years earlier, like literally four years earlier, would have just been a death sentence. But now they have their king's support. So in 1525, Olaus gets married. Ordained priests were allowed to get married in Lutheranism, they just weren't allowed to get married in Catholicism. And this is when he begins to implement um, changes. So mass was now to be sung in Swedish instead of Latin. He also begins translating Lutheran works into Swedish around this time. So more folks can read them and get on board the Lutheran train. Choo choo? No. No. <laughs> it was not choo choo. In 1526 he published the first New Testament in Swedish and he also published a catechism in Swedish. Catechism is like an oral summary of doctrine. It's like a lesson in what you believe. Him and his brother keep on teaching both the king and the general public about Lutheranism. And they're listening, they're interested. No corruption in the church sounds amazing. Like, am I right? At the Diet of Versailles in 1527, the king officially declares the country Lutheran. In 1531, Olaf published a simplified mass in Swedish, and in 1531, King Gustav kind of confirms the country to be Lutheran by appointing Olaus's married brother as the Archbishop of Uppsala. Scandalous. Olaus then writes Swedish hymnal and liturgical manual. In 1539, he's ordained as priest. In 1941, he would heavily contribute to the fully translated into Swedish Gustav Vasa Bible. Shortly after being ordained as a priest, his relationship with the king would begin to deteriorate. We'll circle back, but first, part three, legal career. In 1616, the Rule for Judges Association was published. This set out legal precedents in all Nordic countries really in the end. Now you're probably thinking, 1616, Olaus must be long dead by then. And you're correct. But, whilst this wasn't published until 1616, it's widely believed it was written around 1520 to 40. And it's widely believed Olaus either wrote it all, or wrote it with a few other people, but was the largest contributor. We don't know which is true. Technically, we don't know that either is true, but it seems likely. The rules are essentially 42 general rules, and they form the basis of most Scandinavian law and legal systems, especially in Sweden and Finland. The rules are still included in the Finnish introduction to their legal codes to this day, even though they were never officially put into law at all. And the rules themselves are mostly outdated, they have a very strong religious slant, which I guess you'd expect, he was a theologian after all. Like I mentioned earlier, he was a judge with no legal training. Essentially, when he was made Chancellor of the State in 1531, he just started to learn on the job. I feel like a judge is one of those jobs where that kind of isn't really good enough. But it's the 16th century and he was pals with the king. So, he's now seen as... So, as he's learning on the job, he decided to denote what he felt underpinned a lot of legal decisions and it's believed that that is what led to this to the basis of all Scandinavian law which when you think about the fact it was never technically law is really wild I thought it was and things seem to be going so well for Olaf Petri there's a reason his work may not have been published for a while because it didn't all stay roses so part four fall from grace 1539, Olaf Petri was put on trial for reason. It was alleged he had conspired against the king. Apparently, basically, someone said they'd been conspiring against the king to him in a confession and he didn't report it, which was still treason. It's suggested, and frankly more likely, that Olaus's writings criticising the king's harsh punishment and taxation and the fact Gustav wanted to control the church and Olaus distrusted his autocratic tendencies and felt 
religion should be self-governed are more likely to be the reasoning here. By the way, if Olaf Petri was found guilty of treason on January the 2nd, 1540, and received the death sentence. In fact, it was his brother Lars who signed the judgment condemning him. So it seems like the end of the road for Olaf, right? Wrong. I told you, he keeps surviving when he shouldn't. Buddies got him released on bail. His political career was over. In 1542, he'd receive a royal pardon, so it's probably for the best they didn't kill him. Probably down to that massive translated Bible that was named after the king. Full on arse liquor. Anyway, that same year he was appointed the inspector of Stockholm School. In 1543, he was appointed dean of St. Nicholas Church in Stockholm, where he would remain until his death. He died on the 19th of April, 1552, and was buried at Stockholm. His brother would outlive him by the best part of two decades and would oversee the country's full move to Lutheranism. Since 1898, a large plaque in up outside Sturkirkham commemorating Olaus and his many reforms. And that's the frankly wild story of Olaf Petri. I really hope you enjoyed this. If you did, please give me a cheeky like and subscribe. Let me know in the comments what you think of him. Do you think it's insane how many times it's insane how many times he almost died? Because I do. Also, if I touched on anything you'd like to hear more about, I will happily um, look at any suggestions you have in the comments. In the meantime, thank you so much for your kind words on my recent video about my surgery. I feel very supported by this little community. And um, yeah, I really appreciate all your kindness. But yeah, I'll see you guys soon. Bye. And for criticising Catholicism. There's a van driving up and down my road, I'm sorry. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, 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 blah.